Welcome to the overview video for iGAS 7.3. In this video, we will go through some of the new features and improvements that we have introduced in this release of iGAS. We will start with some workflow improvements and a couple of new data analysis features. We have a data set here consisting of a number of drill holes and we got a nice selection of multi-element assay data. So we'll select a few elements from this list and open up a number of different plots to show some of these features. A new workflow improvement tool that we have added for this release is the selection tool. It lets you select a number of points in one plot, which will be highlighted in all other windows that supports the selection tool. And this includes the data view as well. The selection tool also applies uh, the selection to any new plots within an iGAS session. So as you can see here, I open up an XY plot and the selection is retained. You can also choose to apply an attribute such as color or shape or size to a selection group, which aids in a workflow where you're trying to find patterns between different plots as an alternative to using the attribute manager to create groups one at a time. Another new tool that we have added in this release is the DB scan tool. So let's just minimize um, all of these plots. So the DB scan tool is used as an alternative to the existing k-means clustering algorithm and is particularly useful if you don't know the value of k or the number of groups in your data beforehand. So before we proceed, I want to highlight the multivariate indicator in the attribute manager. So we now have these numbers inside the bracket under rows visible column that indicate how many rows are multivariate within each color group. So here you can see that as I attribute them to lithology groups, you can see which of the major log lithology groups have the most multivariate consistency within each group. And it won't be wise to use the DB scan tool if your data does not have consistency across all selected elements. So let's pick a group of other elements and we know now in this file uh, that the clusters can be defined by varying signatures in major elements. So as we selected those instead, we can see that we don't have the issue with multivariate consistency as we did before. So I can run the DB scan tool from the analysis ribbon. And in this dialog, it lets me choose between using a K to nearest neighbor curve to find the optimal number of groups in the data or type in the epsilon number. So we'll choose the first option for now. And in the resulting K and N plot, we can find the knee in the plot where the gradient sharply changes and use that to assist you to find the epsilon number. So as I click my mouse at any point in this line, you can see that that will give you the epsilon number. And as I click apply, it will assign four clusters to the data. And in this case, the K number that I've chosen works for these variables. And the next time that we run the DB scan tool, you can type in that number and you can let it work off that. So this is used as a shortcut if you already know the data beforehand. So let's look at how the result of the DB scan algorithm looks when you try to plot it in a scatter plot matrix, for example. So let's just open up a new scatter plot matrix based on the selection of elements that we use for the DB scan tool. So you can see that it has clustered the data points uh, quite well. And we look at the scatter plot of titanium versus silica. And it looks like the DB scan tool has done a pretty good job of identifying clusters in these elements. So now uh, let's move on to the attribute manager because what we want to do now is, as you can see here, a couple of these color groups, say cluster one and cluster three, so the red and the green, it looks like they might belong to the same group, but at the same time, we still want to retain those groupings in the attribute manager. So what we want to do now is we want to assign them as one color instead of merging them into one cluster group. So in 7.3, we have made it possible to select multiple groups in the attribute manager and you can assign the same color palette to a group. So it will allow you to retain those groupings, but allows you to assign a uniform color at the same time. So while we are on the topic of attribute manager, um, we'll go through 
some improvements to the QQ plotter. So another improvement that we've added in this release is the ability to create separate QQ graphs based on color attributes. So here, as you know, we have four cluster groups and we can see how the selected variable, titanium, is distributed across these groups. So we have a pairwise option as well, where we plot uh, the QQ plot for default color versus cluster one and so on and so forth. So this is an alternative if you have your data set consisting of multiple assay methods and you can have that information in a text column and use the attribute QQ plot option to, uh, to show that difference between the, the groupings that exist within your data. So let's move on and look at some of the changes that we have in our variable maps. So here we have a 2D data set and we want to first open up a variable map of some Pathfinder elements in the resulting variable maps for this Pathfinder elements. Uh, basically what we can do now as a new option in IGA 7.3 is the ability to export these as separate .gas workspace files. So there's a new option on the bottom of the right hand side toolbar that will export .gas files Con containing uh, thematics for each of the element in this variable map. So basically each .gas workspace file will consist of that thematic contained within the variable map as attribute manager information. So what that means is you can use this to import that information into a third party program uh, like ArcGIS Pro and QGIS. So that's what we will show next. Another improvement that we have added to the QGIS plugin in version 7.3 is the ability to select from multiple GAS files to import into QGIS rather than importing a file one at a time. So in the, from the exported folder, what we can do is we can use the control key or we can drag and select to open multiple ones at the same time. And essentially what this allows you to do is to look at a pattern between a number of different variables in QGIS using our importer tool in a relatively quick workflow. And another new feature that we have added in version 7.3 is the ability to live stream data from IGAS to QGIS. So this requires the user to have both the latest version of our uh, QGIS plugin and I guess version 7.3. So this feature will allow you to live stream data from I guess to QGIS. And I'm just going to turn on the live link now. And if you're familiar with our live link functionality with other programs such as Leapfrog Geo and GoCat, this is quite similar. So as I turn it on, you can see that it will display the same as what we're looking at in I guess. So instead of importing the exported .gas file into QGIS, we can now activate the live link and see any visual change that you do in IGAS being reflected in real time in QGIS. So it does respond well to turning on and off attribute groups. The link also reflects any changes you make to the attribute manager filter group. And as I open up a Jensen cation plot, so I'm doing now any changes I made to the color attributes through this diagram is also reflected in QGIS. And if I create a new column based on this color attribute, that's also reflected in the attribute table within QGIS. And ultimately what this will help you to do is you can do your real time attributing in IGAS and have that reflected in QGIS as an alternative to importing your data as .gas workspace files. So let's move on and look at uh, another data analysis tools. So in this version, we have what we call the recurrence plot. So in this drill hole data set, which consists of a downhole gamma signal. In this recurrence plot tool that we've added in this release, uh, this is a boundary detection technique. And the adaptation of this tool in IGAS can be used to delineate geological boundaries using any downhole signal data, such as geochemical assay or downhole gamma. So first let's select the gamma signature column and before we do anything else, let's look at its signature in a downhole plot. And you can see that there's um, 
section here with different signature to everything else. So as I open the recurrence plot window, which you can find under the analysis menu, uh, we will run it on the same drill hole. And recurrence plot is based on the time series technique. And it involves mapping transitions using a weighted quadrant scan. And you can adjust the threshold using this dialog to remove noise and outliers from the recurrence plot, which will help in defining the boundaries better. So I know that this data set, we have a good threshold at around 22.7. So I'm just going to type that in. And which you can now see has adjusted the output in the recurrence plot to highlight the transitions uh, that you can see from the signal. So now what we can do is we can create a weighted quadrant scan output column. Creating this might take well, so I'll just cancel it. And since I've already calculated this before in the file, so you can see in the downhole plot to the left, you'll see that the red trace line that goes uh, down the hole, that's the resulting weighted output column. And what we can see from this is the inflection in this indicates the boundaries that are reflected um, by the signal itself. So now we can compare the result of the recurrence plot where you can see the map boundaries here. And you can compare that with something like uh, the wavelet tessellation tool. And we can see how it picks up the boundaries as well. So the takeaway from this is there are multiple ways to assign lithological boundaries using some of our uh, automated tools in gas. And so we can use a combination of recurrence plot and wavelet tessellation as an example to determine geological boundaries. So let's move on and do a quick demo of another new feature in GAS, and that is the new Python link. So for those of you who use Python for data wrangling and for doing data analytics work outside of iGAS, you will now be able to combine the visual workflow that you get in iGAS with also all sorts of analytics tool that's found in various Python libraries. So iGAS 7.3 is shipped with a demonstration Python file that showcases how the link works. So you can see that we include that in the installation folder of iGAS within iGAS 7.3 folder. And we have uh, the client.demo.py. So that's the uh, ship demonstration file. And this demonstration file in particular is quite sort of straightforward. So let's look at that in Notepad. Uh, basically, what we provide here are two basic functions. One is to create new attribute groups. And the other one is to create a new column within a in an iGAS workspace. So I'm just going to open up Anaconda and I'm going to run this script uh, within that environment. I'm just going to see how that affects uh, the currently running iGAS workspace. So as I move on uh, back to iGAS, uh, what we can see in the attribute manager within the main .gas workspace is it has created a new color group called Freddy. And basically what it does is the command is telling the first two rows of this file to be attributed using that color and assigning a name Freddy for that uh, color group. And now let's look at the other demonstration set. And as that's running in Python, um, basically what it's doing now is it's grabbing uh, the extent of the file in I guess, and it's going to use that to create a new column within uh, the gas workspace, and it's going to be called from pi. So that's that uh, column at the right hand corner. And basically what it is, it's, it's, uh, it consists of numbers from zero to 100. So that's a very simple script that we ship as an example for uh, the Python link. And ultimately it will help our users who are advanced um, in the way that they set up their codes and environment in Python. So they can link that with our iGAS visualization tools. So the last feature that we will show in this demonstration is in the stereo net tool. So let's open up a structural data set. So let's take a look at our stereo net. So we have added a new axial plane estimator tool. So let's open up just a normal stereo net. And the new axial plane estimator tool uh, can be found on the right hand side toolbar. And basically this tool will attempt to find a plane that divides the fold structure as symmetrically as possible. So let's turn off all of the groups except for poles to bedding. And we just want to make sure that we're looking at uh, just the poles only. 
and in the actual plane estimator tool I can choose from which color group that contains uh, the points that make up the limbs of the fold so there's only one color group that's active now and that's bedding and now once I'm finished with that I'm going to define the poles that constitute each limb using the polygon selector tool so I've already um, used the polygon selector to select the first limb I've selected the second limb and basically what it's done is it has calculated the axial plane that bisects the acute angle passing through the beta axis and the midpoint between the mean poles of the two limbs. I can then choose to save this as a user plane to ensure that it won't be deleted if you change your attribute manager color groups. So that's a brief overview of the axial plane estimator tool and that can also concludes our video on some of the new features and improvements found in this version 7.3 of IAGAS. This version also contains a number of other improvements and fixes and some of these include improvements to the classification and regression trees tool, usability improvements to the attribute manager and increase in supported number of max columns in a workspace and support for MGA 2020 projection. For more info, please refer to our help file or contact us if you have any questions at all. Thanks for watching and we'll see you next time.